Regional and the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping things before we get going. Um, first things first, if you need to use the washroom at any point in time during tonight's program, uh, you are more than welcome to do so. Washrooms are, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're pretty liberal here about that sort of thing. Um, so we ask just that you use the rear door um, to leave and re-enter. Um, just turn right, keep walking a little bit, turn left again, and then you'll find the washrooms. Also, uh, we just ask that you please mute any electronic devices you have with you to prevent disruption during tonight's program. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to take a moment to um, highlight an upcoming. Very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. So Jake Chikasm is Cree from the Lower James Bay region, now living in the Greater Vancouver region. He's a recipient of the Architectural Research Center Consortium, the Jonathan King Medal for 2010 to 2011, uh, which is an award that acknowledges innovation, integrity, and scholarship in architectural and or environmental design research. Currently, Jake is pursuing his PhD with UBC's School of Community and Regional Planning, where he's focusing on the diastic, do, sorry, domestic diaspora experience of Canada's First Nations people at the expense of extractive resource development. We're delighted to have him with us, with us this evening. Uh, please join me in greeting him warmly. conversation, I'm going to present it in a way that there's a lot of questions inside of it at the same time, and you'll get a sense in terms of what it is I'm looking at and where it is I'm trying to go, and you'll see a lot of tension within my conversation that I'm trying to articulate, and right now, especially where we're at in terms of Canadian relations with the whole 150 thing on the forefront, I think these are questions that we're all asking ourselves, but I think if these are questions that we're all also asking ourselves from inside the culture. And so I'll, I'll talk briefly a bit about that stuff as we go through the slides. Um, there's going to be a lot of visual images. Um, I'm not going to try to make it too scholastic in terms of being very academic, but just show you a lot of examples and, and, and talk about the examples and how I'm trying to develop um, a more specific typology that's of, of Cree nature. And one of the slides I put up here is, a, is, a, is, very, is very much a representative of our worldview and where we come from. Uh, instead of giving you an idea of who I am, specifically my background, I'd rather show you where I come from because I think that kind of tells you, it gives you a better sense of who I am as a person and, and my approach to trying to develop an architecture that's of a Cree worldview. Um, it's a very challenging situation to explore this stuff on the West Coast because it's a very much a carving culture. And when you look at our landscape in the northern parts of James Bay, uh, we have a very cold climate, tundra, uh, but we have a very wispy tree line, which you see here, which when you look at that, you start to take cues from the landscape, which tells you how do we have a relationship with place and how we actually work with that material in our design process. So what you see up here um, are the syllabics, and the term uh, translates to wapimisu. And when, when you think about wapimisu, it means about a direct reflection of ourselves, but also to try to bump it up further, but not just a reflection, but being able to take a, a more uh, critical and more, I guess, um, what would you say, a, a, a deliberate hand. You know, like you want to be very assertive in terms of how we're trying to articulate our position in the landscape, but also in the urban experience at the same time. So as you can tell right now, I'm going back and forth from this notion of place to where we're gathered here tonight and how we're trying to articulate everything. Um, at the same time, looking at old vernacular pieces, like you see on the top left hand side, when you see shamanism, which is very much part of our ways of knowing, it, it's a, it, you can talk, talk about it in terms of our spirituality and how this kind of sets up an axis Monday, 
what you would actually use in a Western terminology, right? So at the same time, you start to see this axis that we set up with this, our orientation with how we ground ourselves in the world, uh, but at the same time, allowing for interpretation of objects like this, where we start to play with ideas and metaphors within design, um, for the most part. But tonight's presentation, I just wanted to put this question out there. What, what is this reconciliation all about, and how are we trying to approach it? And But not only from an external point of view by asking the non-Aboriginal population, what is reconciliation? I don't think we take enough time to actually ask ourselves, as Indigenous people, what is reconciliation, and what is our responsibility to that? Um, one of the ways I, I address that is, is really deconstructing ourselves, deconstructing the Indigenous person. And what you see here is a, is a teepee, which is actually situated on a Ojibwe territory in, in Northern Ontario. And I took offense to it because when I was teaching a couple of years ago at Laurentian University, I thought it was inappropriate for our own, our own Ojibwe brothers and sisters to appropriate a typology that wasn't of that territory. So here we are challenged with the notion of trying to lay claim to a specific place with something that doesn't represent that culture. And I thought it was appropriate to actually come away with a contemporary response with this wood typology, bent wood, that's more um, representative of an Ojibwe style of that territory. So by challenging the culture from the inside, I think that's one way to look at reconciliation in terms of how do we actually try to break down this or understand this notion to approach of design. So <laughs> I'll come back to this slide later on, but I just wanted to put that out there as a flavor to our conversation tonight and in terms of trying to talk about this place of story. Um, I think beginning with a story is a good way to actually start off. Um, so this is where I am. This is where I come from. I'm from James Bay. Uh, my, my parents, my grandparents come from the west side and my grandparents, my grandmother's side comes from the east coast of James Bay. And so a lot of my, oh, we're here. <laughs> you can't see some of the images on the side. Let me just turn that over. Um, but anyways, what you see here is a sequence of photographs that kind of gives you an idea of this notion of place, my introduction of who I am, my understanding of how I was grown up, uh, taught and guided like my grandfather through a, a situation of place. And part of the introduction was talking about this domestic diaspora. And, and I thought it was interesting because this whole notion here was about trying to uh, develop a cross-cultural connection that I, that I experienced in the School of Architecture. Um, and part of the challenge that there was a, a gap in Canadian academic settings where there was not representation of indigenous ways of knowing. So the idea was to look for mechanisms or keys that would allow me to insert this worldview, not only into the academy, but also in the practice. And when I say practice, I talk about a situation where a couple, year, a couple of years afterwards, there was a competition that went into the Venice Biennale, not, the, not, the, not this one, but the one beforehand, and they were looking for the, the story of migration within Canada. And it was mainly stories of people coming to Canada, which, which I thought was interesting. But at the same time, I thought, we do have our own migration story. We are displaced in our own country as a result of extractive resource development. So by exploring that notion of extractive resource development, here what you see in James Bay is a hydroelectric development project. And that's a direct story from my grandmother who told me about her grandfather and her mother, his fa her father, witnessing the transformation of the landscape over the course of time. So that was a direct story handed down to my grandmother. And on the right hand side, again, you can't see the slides, I'm sorry, but it was a story of being raised by my grandfather up in this territory and watched this devastation happening to the landscape. Uh, part of that response was partaking in that competition. And so being the only indigenous person who made it to the Ontario qualification rounds, um, I decided to foreground this notion of domestic diaspora in our own country and talk about hydroelectric development, but at the same time, talking about this, this way of working with material and how we can actually have a representation of forum that is very much informed by a Cree worldview of actually working with material. Um, obviously working in with technology and using simple design tools like SketchUp to help interface this notion of how do we maintain tradition, but also become part of the modern practice, practice world at the same time? Uh, for the most part, that's where a lot of this research has taken off, uh, trying to ground it in a real world experience 
watching a lot of traditional ways fall to the wayside and understanding there's, there's a language that comes with the making of this space and the making of this, uh, this type of architecture that I'm trying to set precedence for that's very much part of a global discussion now. So when I think about that, that is where a lot of my conversation, a lot of my experience in terms of how I'm moving forward through the practice or moving towards the practice of actually developing a more critical architecture that's informed by the sensibilities that people are trying to maintain, not only an indigenous worldview, but also an external worldview. Um, the reason I say that is, <laughs> I always come up with this slide, and I think it's great. Is anybody recognizing this is? Aside from the Joker? <laughs> it's actually a, a, a printing of um, Sir John A. MacDonald, and it was, uh, it was a, a rendering done by Gerald McMaster, and I thought it was so appropriate because he talks about the situation, have I got an ask for you? And I want, to bring, I want us to remember this because there's a situation going on right now in Canadian architecture that we are still part of this Indian Act, and as a result of it, unless one of us from the inside of the culture takes a stance and says enough is enough, that we, can't, we cannot afford to have non-Aboriginal architects come into our community and dictate how it is we design. It's a very important piece. So part of my approach is to actually take on that challenge and push back in some ways. And so he just talks about here how architecture, how people have struggled between this back and forth reality between the reserve and off reserve, et cetera, but also having to balance the, the technical, the sociological, et cetera, all this other stuff that comes with it. Um, but what strikes me more is, is this conversation by Russell Barsh. The same year, he put out a, com a quote that I, I think just resonates with the, the Canada 150 situation right now. And for us to ask that question of, um, <clears throat> what, what is Canada? Uh, I'm sorry that the uh, slides are off to the side, but um, I'll read it uh, quite slowly here. Um, he actually gets right to the heart, and, 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 I, and I, I think it's a very critical comment because I think it's a question we all got to ask ourselves. What is Canada? What is Canada 150, and, and who's determining what that is all about? What does that say in terms of our relations? Um, but he goes on to say, uh, when it is said Aboriginal peoples have contributed to Canadian society, it can be implicitly argued that there was a Canadian society to receive Aboriginal peoples' gifts. Um, this statement implies an exchange between two separate and distinct societies. Um, there, was a, a Canada, there was a Canada before Aboriginal peoples encountered it. And what he's saying here is that the construction of Canada was actually taking place elsewhere, long before there was any recognition or any, any conversation with Indigenous peoples. And he's trying to say that there was a Canada that, was, that would have been reasonably recognized had it not been for that conversation or that precedence taking place elsewhere. So in many ways, as a result of that stuff, he's talking about this notion of cooperation and conflict at the same time. And so for, for that reason, I just wanted to share that conversation because I think it's a very important piece of uh, literature to, to keep, at the back, keep in the back of my mind as I move forward. But at the same time, when he talks about this notion of indigeneity, right? Um, I don't necessarily have to get into the image in the background. I just got to um, highlight a couple of terms. And, and one of the terms is the indigeneity, the term indigenous and how this is becoming so watered down that it, it's become something that's totally unrecognizable. And who's starting to lay claim over the term? So what I use the term for is that trying to understand what is indigeneity in terms of material practice. So, Without having to get into that, I, I just talk about this material relationship. It's a different type of mind-body relationship when I think about architecture and how we're stepping into this situation of reconciliation and indigenous uh, architecture at the same time. I want to set up the, 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 the body of work that I want to show. It's more so a process as opposed to just theory. Um, but Really me that things on the side. <laughs> uh, but it, it came out with this notion like indigenous architecture is informed by this relationship to the land. And, and the reason I share this slide is because when, I, when one of the first times I was in graduate school or undergrad school, one of my instructors for theory had pretty much told the class of 150 <coughs> people, do you know why the hippies are set up this way? And, and, and how they were set up on the plains? And it was curious because at the time, I don't think there was a lot of people pushing back on this notion of what is indigenous architecture and how it's being represented in the classroom. Well, my instructor at the time said, well, at the time before contact on the planes, they used to sit in circles inside the teepee. 
And the only way to attack the leader is that you would look for the silhouette of the Indian standing up. And that would be the leader. And that's how you would take him down with the arrow or the gun. And I thought, what a bunch of crock. How could you tell this to a young audience of people and what you think about architecture? I thought, what? Like, that's total misrepresentation in terms of what you're trying to educate the future of designers. And where's the responsibility that you have to tell the truth of that? So for me, that was, that was an indicator. That was a red flag. I was like, wait a second, that's not true. So I'll show you later on. But in terms of just breaking that stuff down, I had to do a lot of research in terms of breaking down what does architecture mean, right? So instead of getting into the whole sustainability idea of what is uh, um, architecture a sustainable factor, I just, you know, just throw this up there for, for simple reasons to see that there is a, this, this, this uh, disjunct between an indigenous perspective and non-indigenous perspective. Uh, just everything from architecture, uh, philosophy, religion, economics, you start to see there is a split. And, and many people understand that now because sustainability is now the, the, the catchphrase, right? It's been around for 20 years. We all know what sustainability means. But for the most part, it comes down to this. And, and it was nice to push back using language and using story. And at the time of, of going through this process, <coughs> The person on the right hand side is John Luskin, and he put out a book a long time ago called The Seven Lamps of Architecture, which I thought were interesting. But the seven lamps of architecture are one for one when you look at the, the traditional teachings of the First Nations people. So I look at that theory at the same time as an opportunity to educate cross-culturally in terms of how we can actually move forward with reconciliation. The literature is out there. Um, it's just a matter of being able to take that literature and now manifest that into an actual body of, of work, of form. Um, this is interesting because I think it's important to push back. It's, uh, to use the word redskin, it seems to be offensive in many ways, but at the time, in 2004, there wasn't a lot of pushback, as you see in the media today, as you see in Twitter, etc. People are pushing back, changes the logo, etc. Um, moving forward, an opportunity came to actually look at precedents. And so for this one here was a, a project for the city of Toronto in terms of trying to develop a an architecture that was of regional representation of the Southern First Nations of Ontario. So the whole idea, again, was to, to speak with the community, look at a traditional form of architecture, insert some of the service needs that they wanted in the community. They wanted a, a ceremonial space that would allow them to experience it in the city without having to leave. Uh, they looked for classrooms. They wanted theater space. They wanted a, a youth recreation center. This is only one part of the floor plan. And this was another section here. Um, another, another demoralizing story with this thing, because I, I share this because I think it's important to hear the challenge that we experience as a political individual trying to exercise space making. And, and, and while I served on the, the Toronto Urban Aboriginal Strategy at the time, I had to work alongside municipal, federal, and provincial governments and work with the interlocutor. And it was frustrating because the community had wanted to take all their money into this project and say, yes, let's do this for our community. Um, I know there's a similar story happening here in Vancouver. The youth are trying to get a, a project off the ground. But <laughs> when the federal government says, no, we can't give you one because all the other cities are going to want one, I thought, how dare you say that? The, the community wants this project. They want it as a community-driven <coughs> exercise. They want to have a facility like this that actually speaks to their identity speaks to the nature, the nature of place and, and the services that they want, and it represents who they are as Six Nations people. So there was an opportunity to do something of that nature and talk about regionalism at the same time. And it's unfortunate. Um, the project has legs. It goes up and down like this, whatever the capacity is there to actually to, to develop it. But it was an opportunity to gift. Again, so one of the aspects in our culture is to gift our knowledge, right? Gift our skill set instead of saying, you know, they'll never be able to do it for themselves. Well, in this case, when you do have the skill set, here's an opportunity to share that and gift it back to the community. So this was working alongside Habitat for Humanity, you know, because they had an incentive to want to develop projects like this. And so here was an opportunity, and we still have some legs. There's still some life inside of it. Um, and so later on, moving on and working with some of the other First Nations in the South, uh, here was an opportunity to work with Kettle Point First Nation. Uh, we went in as students, but came out with a commission. And it was very unusual for students to walk into the community and come out with a commission. And, and so we actually worked with the community and looked at the community plan and developed some sort of form in terms of what they wanted. But at the end of the day, they wanted a grounds. They wanted some sort of ceremonial piece that was going to actually push the conversation forward a bit and, 
in terms of who they were. They wanted something contemporary, and that was going to speak of a, a different, a different time, a different wave of action to move forward. So it was, it was a nice exercise to work out. But this is where this type of form making process started to come into play because it started to work with the community in dialogue and having a conversation through materialism. Um, that was a nice project, and there was another one that just is sitting there on the shelf. Um, when I talk about the, the, the learning experience, again, getting back to the academic stuff, this whole notion of regionalism was taken off across Canada. And you started to see many projects throughout the country starting to develop a local sense of the economy based on the First Nations capability and what they were surrounded by. Uh, so for this one here, this idea was to look at a, a form, a traditional form that was multi-purpose, multi-purpose, uh, purposeful. Um, and it was just basic TV structure, right? And trying to understand that the economy of a place can actually go back to this travest, this horse and travest, where you have a form that's very utilitarian, becomes multifunctional, and all obviously expands into a larger communal setting, right? You know, so what we call here is the chabaton in terms of a cree structure developing community based on a place. The reason I said that is because, again, having to go back to this notion of art, art, art and architecture. And so some people will recognize the, the painting on the wall here by Joseph Turner. And, and it, it's almost like a metaphor for today of what's going on in our First Nation communities because, you know, what the um, rain train and steam through the landscape is very much happening in our communities right now where we're starting to see industrialism and new waves of technology infiltrating the First Nation communities, but we're still stuck with a situation where we're, just, we're still living in deplorable houses, right? So something has to change, obviously, and somebody has to take a different approach of how we're actually going to approach these communities. Um, otherwise, I think we're still going to be stuck in situations like this. Um, again, going back to one of the earlier slides, talking about this notion of occupation and conflict, <coughs> This was a story, again, going back to my grandmother. I, 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 I always come back to this story because it, it's interesting to hear those stories as a toddler, as a, a young person, and, and just hear the, the resonance of that to come out and to see this stuff unfold on TV as, as a young person. It just sticks with you for the longest time. And so this is the LG2 complex that's historical uh, for, for many reasons and wrong reasons at the same time. So this was in 92 when this project was developed, right? And so I remember sitting there talking to my grandmother at, at, at nighttime watching TV, and then eventually as a result of this, right? Again, obviously, text is cut off, but as a result of that, as a result of that ban, it makes me wonder what's going to happen in this province in terms of what's going on with the, with the development of the dam up, up here in British Columbia, that we're possibly going to see a shift or something lost as a result of that type of infrastructure development. So whether or not we can actually learn from lessons taken already established across this country, I, I'm doubtful. I'm doubtful that we're actually going to learn from the mistakes that we keep doing within our communities, within our provinces across this country. It's bound to happen, and as a result of that dam, uh, 10,000 caribou died in the northern Quebec. And so that was very interesting to watch that conversation unfold on news, on, on the late night news there. Uh, growing up, and so it, it's just mindful to understand this notion of occupation and conflict and, and where that has led to, right? It, it seems to be not only in the landscape, but it's also in the architecture of what we see and, and what's the flavor of the day, what are we talking about? And as we try to move towards reconciliation, are we actually making moves? Are we making amends with a lot of the stuff that we're trying to achieve? Um, again, not having to delve into the, the, the image, we all know the story, but this notion of who's occupying whose mind now. That's the question I want to ask in return. It, it, it used to be that, yes, our mind was occupied with a form of way, but now this whole notion of uh, environmentalism and stewardship and having to consult with communities is somewhat in the air, questionable. Um, I stay on, on the occupation and conflict um, situation because what we have now is a situation, like I said earlier on, where we have a large body of non-Aboriginal architects going into our communities and, and telling us, very much like that first slide about Gerald McMaster, the, uh, have, you, have I got an act for you? <coughs> this is a situation where we see three different communities working with on the same typology 
where we have non-aboriginal architects coming in and working with the local resources, but using the same type of technology to come up with three different scenarios. And this is not representative. I think many of us would agree it's not representative of who we are. Um, again, it's that story of watching this continuous large brush saying, this is how we design our communities. This is who you are. You know, our community is not being able to push back and articulate something different. Um, it, it's an interesting process. Um, what you see is, is a series of local timbers bent into place. Um, interesting enough, when this first came out, I was a graduate student, and this architect, Richard Croker, came to our, our graduate studio in Ryerson, and he, we sat down across the table, and he was asking questions. He was asking questions, how to overcome the structural integrity of it. I knew, and I, I had a sense of why it wasn't working, and I, I, I didn't share my information. I just felt that it was another intrusion of, you know what, I'm gonna pick this individual's brain and take what he's got. It turns out like his practice, and, and I, I decided no, I wasn't going to do it because I could just, could just see what's going on in the landscape and, and how the academic or how the, the institute is a goldmine for this place for people developing uh, collaborative practices with students in design. And, and practitioners, I, I would say, taking a very unethical approach. I, I think it's very unethical in terms of how they, how they do it. Uh, for that reason, I push back on it again. Um, it's interesting to watch it. Uh, it's interesting to process to see where it is being constructed. Um, it's, it's a capacity building exercise for the community, obviously. But at the end of the day, the object sits there and there's not a lot of you know, stuff that comes out of it. Um, in terms of like, this notion of place, I just threw this up for the sake of just you know, like, harping on the idea of the, the teepee and, and how I pushed back against the instructor and said, well, that, I think you got the wrong idea. I'm not sure where you got that knowledge. <laughs> and, and I think you should actually go back and, and look at that. And, and I remember having this very <clears throat> passionate conversation with the instructor. And then later on, he, I, I put forward an idea that I wanted to speak about this notion of Ruskin and, and teachings and how they overlap. And, and I said, well, I'm going to use the traditional teachings. And he goes, what do you mean? And, and I said, this is uh, how I'm going to approach it. And it's going to align. And his response was like, I, I think you bit off more than you can chew. And, and I thought, how could you say that? Again, you're a non-Aboriginal person trying to educate me on my own culture. <laughs> and it got very heated. And at the end of the day, I said, I don't think it's more than a bit off that I can chew. I think it's more than you can digest. You know? and, 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 and he didn't expect that. He didn't expect for a young person to push back and say, you know what? I have something to say. So with that said, um, the lamp of sacrifice. I, I thought it was interesting that John Ruskin back in the 1800s was able to articulate this notion of indigeneity. And, and he talks about this notion of architecture must be conce conceived in the style indigenous to a nation. So there you see the first word indigeneity, indigenous being used back in the 1850s on another foreign territory across the big water, if you want to call it. <coughs> And he had a notion of what this notion of sustainability was all about. So I thought that was very interesting to see that there is an opportunity to have a cross-collaboration based on literature itself, and how you can use literature to, to try to address this notion of reconciliation and, and use it as a filter, use it as an extra lens to actually talk about the making of place and the making of space. So essentially, again, going on, just show, showing some simple precedents. That would have been the, the, the wigwam that I pushed back against in Laurentian, saying that we, we have to acknowledge internally from ourselves that as an indigenous person, we have to take the position to, to call our own spade. You know, we see that, we don't look at it that way. But we, we must push back internally, not externally at the same time, and that to realize that there's ways of actually approaching design that are, are far more in tune to who we are in the environment. Uh, the reason I throw this up is because it's a, it's a simple matrix of how they teach you to design in school. Um, it's very, for me, again, it was an eye-opener to realize that you're trying to rationalize or, or, or find reason for a lot of this stuff when, in fact, a lot of indigenous cultures already had this way. They already knew how to work with sim symbolisms and circles and shapes to develop some sort of sequence of design that had a resolution to it, right? So you don't necessarily have to rethink these tie halves. And obviously you see uh, 
prolific architect, uh, Douglas Carnell, employs that same technique, but he doesn't rationalize it down to a matrix, right? He just lets it come through. Um, so in, in terms of many ways, I just wanted to share some ideas in terms of how we move in that direction and how this notion of art, architecture, and identity is very much of the fold. Um, obviously, West Coast uh, style, uh, looking at precedent locally. Um, I just pulled a lot of slides from, from where we're coming at. And then obviously, myself, you know, I showed you at the very beginning of what that, that shaping tent object looked like. I think I really have another slide in here. But it actually gives you a sense in terms of like a, a smaller microcosm of, a, of, a, of a, a way of situating ourselves in the world as opposed to being a culture with our, our back up against the mountain and looking out towards the ocean. Um, I just wanted to throw that in there again just to, to remind us that you know this conversation was happening long ago, back in 1630 with the first colonial village in Massachusetts, right? It's a mixture of a wigwam with, with a with a doorfish, you know. So obviously, they're trying to mix this notion of architecture, of place, and industrialism to, to a certain situation. And so I push back with this notion that you know we, we have a lot of local precedents across Canada that we can actually fall back on, but having to really you know stand beside those structures and and, and make a, a reasonable argument for how we actually work with the material and developing a sense of space. But at the same time, um, one of the things that I find interesting is this notion of uh, our own identity being shifted, right? And you know, I get fascinated by images like this because I, I see this as a, a very beautiful structure, but the one thing that stands out is the cavalry hat, right? And all of a sudden, we start to see this mixture of our culture, and you see it in powwows and how we um, mix up our regalia, We'll have a mixture of different foreign and local materials and symbolisms. Um, for me, that's interesting because it, it, it just talks about this migration going east to west and north to south, right? In terms of how architecture was being being developed, and, and all of a sudden there was a different set of ideas being applied to it. And, and I tell myself to to bring it back, you know, to bring it back to this notion from a shift in mind regionalism down to a feeling, right? So one of the ideas here is this interior, um, the wrong slide. But this notion of that, in Cree, we, we say Oshichi Kewin, um, which is actually very much an extension of this, but this is the Cree, the Cree uh, narrative, that I guess you could call it, of actually working alongside our grandmothers, our grandfathers, and, and learning very simple techniques that actually talk about this notion of, of working with the material. And for me, that is what it is, right? It's this notion, again, of of looking at the material and how it was used beforehand and understanding that there is a language out there when you think about a Finnish aphorism, they say Banta Rutologasta, and it talks about the bender from the wire. And that's what uh, um, another architect was talking about. And I asked my elders, how do we say that? And so they said Oshichikewin. And you know, Oshichikewin means to bend it from the, to bend it from the, from the body. It carries the same intonation that there is some sort of moral understanding with the way we work with material and how we can actually reconstruct a sensibility, a place making, um, in terms of how we, we might move forward in the future based on a Cree worldview. Uh, one of the ideas before doing that, being an instructor myself, uh, I always think about this when I, when I sit down and speak to the students and have them understand the full potential of material before we actually cut it down, right? We, we tend to take it and strip it down and then eventually we'll buy a product at Ikea or something like that, you know, that looks like that. And in terms of why do we go in that direction, I just find it's kind of redundant. Um, when in fact we have situations like this, again, you start to see this notion of indigeneity, uh, First Nation form making processes being displaced. Um, showing up in different urban fabrics where you're starting to see a shift in how ceremonies would actually be conducted, right? So this being, again, sort of the, the, the shaman on the right-hand side following some sort of form that he would see beforehand. I believe I have another slide in beforehand to show this. Um, no, but this was just another notion. In recent times, in 2005, it was nice to actually collaborate with an architect who understood that we're at a sense now where we're starting to see within Canadian architecture and schools of architecture that 
there is a voice emerging and that there are uh, practitioners who want to change the way that design is being uh, taught and, and what we're bringing with it. Um, this, again, is just falling back on symbolism, uh, using the Cree language. The, the slide that you saw at the beginning was this notion of walking recent and having to exercise a sense of agency at the same time. I think that's very important to try to share and, and, and bring, uh, bring through with the making of this space. Um, just some text, I'll just quickly skip over this one. Uh, this idea was the notion of using language again, you know, the spiritual and, and the abstract go together. Um, but this is where the body of work now starts to get a bit bigger, and how we're trying to use architecture and, and how I'm pushing it forward by working with an understanding of the material. Um, again, on the right-hand side, the Axis Monday, and you start to see this notion of how the architecture is being displayed. It's unfortunate you don't see on this side, but this was an opportunity to develop a project for the Venice Biennale and how we were actually inserting notions of gravity and airflow. Like very simple design principles to work with, that architects work with, but also trying to come up with an abstract concept in terms of how we can create design. Um, again, it was just part of an exercise. And then these are a couple of objects that came out of it. Like, so this notion of a, a skin and bone type of structure, right? So we actually looked at materials and created larger frames that must have been two meters high two and a half meters high, and then slowly working through this process. One of the things when I spoke to Richard Croker, when he came to, to Ryerson and, and looked at the material, so he, he was working with stuff like this with other practitioners in Nova Scotia. And so one of the ideas was this dilemma of the urban Aboriginal experience in terms of how do we take the traditional form making process and try to understand where we are today laid against this grid in the city, but at the same time maintain a sense of uh, sensibility of the material. So as a form making process, one of the exercises I do is, is going back to a very simple form like this, understand and share this, it becomes very dialectical in terms of working with material and students, and then having them to explore ideas like this. You know, so we, we go through a process of, of trying to find some sort of principle, but some sort of simple technique that would um, capture like the, the main idea of, of, the, of the program. And so by exercising this stuff, we start to move things around very quickly, and all of a sudden you start to see things unfold, right? Very quickly, very, very tactile with the body, and then start developing more concepts. Eventually what comes out of it is a form like this. So you see this transition of working with material, very simple, and, and trying to find a space for it. What was nice about this one here, working with the Ryerson community, to hear this emergence of a two-spirited voice in the community come forward and say that, you know, we're looking for our space in the city. How do we create a ceremonial space that allows us to identify with it, our space in the community? And so here was an opportunity where somebody called it womb traveling. And to me, I've never heard that before, but it was nice to hear somebody say, well, how do we transition to a space that allows us to do that? And so following that, it was an opportunity to collaborate with my partner. And so she was exploring this concept of a, a ceremony, placenta, and here I was set against the notion of displacement. And so what you see on the bottom here is the James Bay River Basin, and what you would see is like a, a, an x-ray of a, a placenta. And so the idea was to have this conversation between the experience that she was looking for and the experience I was looking for at the same time. So how can we have this conversation that's going to be internal to the culture again, but at the same time, try to address some of the larger forces imposing on First Nation culture. Um, and by doing that, looking at material again, is having to look at, take an inventory of what's going on in the First Nation and realize there's a lot of goods coming into our community and a lot of those goods don't go back out. They end up in the landfill and they become unused products. So the idea was to go into a community in North Bay and look at it, take an inventory of what they have, what can I work with, and at the same time, my technician, um, Francis, at the time, we were actually working with material, and we understood that this is a, a Home Depot product, and we can still work with traditional materials to come up with a form-making process and work with a local high school and push the notion of advanced trades a bit further. I, I figure that if, <laughs> here's, another, here's another thorn in my side. Um, one of the things I, I really, have trouble with is when I hear our First Nation leaders tell our communities to fill the trade gap. 
I think it's the wrong message. It's like saying you can drive heavy truck in Port McMurray and make a six-figure salary and still have the affordable housing in a nice house and a nice truck in your, in your driveway. Or you can actually tell them, go on and become engineers, architects, and help redesign the communities. So on the one hand, we have a situation when you hear the national chiefs talk, you'll hear those messages. And for me, that's, that's, that's the wrong message to be sending to not only our First Nations youth, but also to the public, uh, the Canadian public at the same time. So, so by doing that, we were able to work with the high school community to actually say, you know what, we're going to go back and look at what you have in the community, and we're going to work with the, the program you have in, the, in your school, and we'll start to explore a different idea of, of placemaking that's more in tune to, to the nature of that space. And so what came out of it was this large installation we did. This was the first one, the, the first artifact to create that actually talks about this making of a Cree typology. Um, I'm trying to push the idea of a typology beyond the teepee, because I think we're more than teepees, we're more than dream catchers and medicine wheels. So I think the idea is that we can actually do something like that, right? That it's going to take some pushing back to actually create that. So we started to look at this object, and, and as a result of it, it was nice to watch one afternoon from the photograph. But in the back left-hand, right-hand corner up there, there would be these two elders, and they would show up on their four-wheelers in the morning, and they would drive in, they would drive away, drive in. And they did that for like two, three days. And finally, I just walked over, and they just said, what do you make it? And I said, art. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> and he, and he goes no, what do you make it? And he, he was asking me a deeper question. And obviously, I said, art. <laughs> and he goes, I see a canoe. I see a snowshoe. I see other things. Is that right? I see a, a freighter canoe. And so it was nice to hear that story pushed back on to me to realize that you're actually doing something that resonated with the older culture in the community. And it was great because the, as a result of it, we were able, my partner was able to have a film festival. So she actually had her film festival inside here. And it was nice. It, it became her video screen at the same time. And so it, 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 in some ways, it became the womb. It became the womb for the community, right? And so for that reason, it's Joel's my partner back there. <laughs> so this whole idea of being able to have this conversation with architecture communities, Cross, you know, and people wanted to uh, revitalize certain traditional ceremonies in terms of homemaking, family making. Again, I think we were just talking to one of the local, uh, one of the attendees tonight, and we talked about this notion of housing. You know, like we have to rethink the family unit in terms of this First Nation housing being delivered out to communities. It's not enough just to say, here's another, um, here's another house, here's an innovative freighter, a freight house, you know, stuff like that. So I think it's important for me to actually take that challenge on and to start asking questions of how can we actually do this that's going to be informed. And there's, there's a, um, an element of discipline, I guess, having to, to stay within that, that process to, to create these objects. Uh, three of them were created over the course of, I think, a year and a half, 18 months. Uh, the first one being up at North Bay, and then this one being at the Pan Am Games in Toronto, and then this one here was the, the last one in North Bay. Um, it was nice, this one here, because this one was actually like a basket, a series of baskets holding the community and turning our back against the urban forum, right? So in many ways, there's an opportunity to be political with how we actually create architecture. Um, from a Cree perspective, that's where I'm coming from with a lot of the work. And so in summation, when, when I think back to that slide, it, what is it with this reconciliation and how do we do it? Um, I think personally for myself, obviously, as an indigenous person, it, it begins with the body. Right? It begins with my body, how I have this relationship with working with material, but also understanding there's a different ethos that comes with that, and at the same time having to answer that question of reconciliation from both sides of the fence, and understanding that you know it's going to take just as much lifting on our part as it is the other part. To, to address this notion of reconciliation. Um, I've got a couple of slides left. I think that's pretty much it. Um, I just wanted to come back to this one because I, I, I was speaking to, to, to Mark and, and speaking about this notion of what, what's going on. And there's an opportunity to actually develop a piece this summer in Vancouver around the 150. And, and I'm kind of like on the fence uh, watching the news and how people are reacting to this and, and realizing there's no better place to actually to put, develop this work here in the, in the Vancouver Public Library and to actually explore what some of these things might mean, right? 
So this is just a sample of work where I'm actually taking Ruskin's work now, recontextualizing it, but also laying it up against First Nations uh, teachings. And so when you think of the lamp of life, you know, I could have went through all those slides with Ruskin, but I thought that would have been a totally another hour conversation. Um, but this notion that they do line up one for one, uh, this idea of life, truth, etc. And then obviously acknowledging people like Susan Point in terms of what she's done here in Vancouver when you think of the Richmond Oval. It's nice to look at the buttress on the side there and you see the salmon that she's carved out in terms of what's going on, right? So there, there's many cues in Vancouver that we can actually reference. And so part of the next step of the work is to actually foreground some of that relationship building between the city and the West Coast. Um, this lamp of bravery sacrifice, unfortunately, again, side, but it, it's acknowledging like the war veterans. This is just a draft in work right now where I'm going with it. Um, one of the ideas is to think about the notion of the Hudson Bay Company and that influence it had on the West Coast by them bringing buttons, right? So this, this connection between the Hudson Bay Company being a very big influential partner in the development of the country and how that might work. Um, right now, I'm at three. You know, so I was going to open it up for a conversation into the ideas, uh, ideas of having the inclusion, thinking about Métis population, thinking about the Inuit population. Uh, there's going to be a wide representation of what's going to come through this body of work, and um, we'll just see where it goes. Um, that's pretty much it. and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I presume you mean between the indigenous peoples and the European society. Is that reconciliation you're talking about? Well, both. I'm talking about both. I think it's a question that's been posed to all society, and, and I think I'm just sharing my responsibility within the reconciliation that I think I have a part to play in terms of coming to terms with that relationship, but also in terms of our relationship with ourselves to place. Uh, the slide, the, the image you see in the background was a classic example of where, where I thought, if I don't say anything as an architect in helping to create spaces within academy, then I'm not doing my responsibility to that generation. Because I think they should be informed critically about, you know, acknowledging generation because they're on Facebook, they're on SketchUp, but they're also on, on Minecraft. And an example was in Manitoulin Island, we did a consultation with the community, and the architect, as a consultant going in, they wanted to figure out how can we lay out the school. And it was interesting to go through an exercise and watch the youth draw their spatial sense of what they wanted in the school. And it was so surprising when we pinned up the drawings to see how to scale their drawings were. And it's because of, of Minecraft. They're creating these spaces within Minecraft. And the, the question is, how do we interface that with the GIS? there is a possibility to do that because they, they have a very good spatial sense. I know uh, speaking with a professor in Mexico right now, it's an idea that we want to explore is how can we, how can we bring that together that actually brings their experience immediately to this, to this realm. Because I think you would agree SketchUp is just, it just got you, right? That seems to be what you see in studio right now. But how can we actually push it forward a bit and realize this next generation already has the answers in many ways in terms of technology. Um, in terms of engineering, I remember when I was speaking to Richard Croker, again, getting back to that question about Richard Croker, he, he was looking for the answer, what was going on here. And I realized he was, he was hung up on the connection of these pieces coming together. But I think you, you would understand with the connections, when you, when you lock it down right away, you, you lock down the sheer forces, right? The sheer forces are too much to overcome. But I, I think it's a very simple exercise through experimentation that when you work with the material at that, sorry, at that scale, we actually locked down too much here. It was nice, but at the same time, this, uh, the projects that came afterwards, we were able to have like a slip form connection in between that 
un that unlocked that potential, and the, the, the forms became way more expressive afterwards, right? So that's at a very simple level of being able to work with the material at a very humanly scale and force. Obviously, we have design programs where we can insert all these units, and they can pump out the, you know, the resulting forces, et cetera. But that, that's very much in, ter in terms of understanding that, and I, that's another, you could say it's a, a piece of, um, I don't know, I guess education of learning material. But instead of going into a lab, this is very much like land-based learning. Right? So it's, it, there, there's a lot of correlation between what you're asking in terms of the experiments and the follow-ups that come out of this type of exercise. So I hope that answers a bit of your question. So you're bringing a high tech look to um, original native uh, towns. I wouldn't say it's high tech. <laughs> well, well, I mean, these sculptures and these things that you're making aren't exactly old or traditional, like they're the modern. Prin the principles are old, but the, the materials are modern. So it's a, it's a mixture of both, you could say. It's putting a modern twist on traditional, traditional ways. But that, that's what I'm saying, you're giving this sort of new look, modern look, or, or incorporating it into the, you know, um, older town, mm -hmm. you know, which obviously have an older look or, you know, traditional been there for a long time. And all of a sudden, here's this brand new modern sculpture. In some ways, yeah, that, that's hopefully the goal, to actually explore some of that idea, those ideas. And, and they're not complaining? And, I, well, it's nice because when I, when I felt that the, we had the elders sitting off to the side on this four-wheeler and he was curious from day to day, I, I thought that was nice to hear and to hear that there was some sort of reassurance in terms of the approach that I'm taking and slowly allowing this thing to unfold. It, it's asking the right questions along the way too at the same time and to have somebody you know, tell you stories. Well, it's probably kind of difficult for them because they're, they're used to older, you know, tradition, and then all of a sudden here's this new structure, and I guess they're thinking, well, the world has changed, and we kind of got to get used to it, but maybe they're not 100% I, I wish I would have left the last slide in there. There's a situation where in, in the schools that we're trying to teach, it, it's very much that question of having to ask the question, and I'm pretty sure some of you guys seen it on CBC the other day, that a lot of our youth are asking for other things than just birch bark canoes. And, and, I, and I, I agree with that because I think the youth are tired of building birch bark canoes in art schools. You know, they want something more. They're hungry for something more. And I think by, by actually trying to develop something that's of that nature, of that flavor, that resonates with them based on their time, I think that's where we have to go. And part of that is having to challenge the old paradigm and realize you know, we, we can do both of these things at the same time, but we have to be able to, to answer questions in the future at the same time. Hi. I'm not exactly sure if you've had the opportunity recently to visit the Vancouver Art Gallery, but it's really quite an interesting situation that they have there. Uh, it seems like between the three rooms of the Art Gallery, you start with uh, a lot of Susan Point's uh, exhibits, and uh, they're absolutely phenomenal. And then it seems like as you go to the next floor, a different era appears. It seems to be a very um, generation X, generation Y, uh, uh, sort of youth range and then as we get to the third floor something interesting happens it kind of develops into this this interesting um post-structural situation where they're almost subverting or like inverting a lot of the uh western uh icons and they're introducing um a first nation's elements and things like that but it seems like it's very very structured they have to think about everything as they're doing it i'm just curious about the teleology the, the process they is how organic your uh, structures are relevant with relevance to integrating these cultures, or evolving these cultures, pardon me. That, that's a question, and, and I think internally for myself, that that's what I'm asking within a Cree perspective uh, of watching other artists like Brian Young, who's doing this with Nike masks and, and lawn chairs, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's asking these bigger globalization questions too, because we are part of that society now, right? You see the shift in their identity, so in, in terms of this approach, it's very much along the same line uh, of trying to push that forward a bit, and, and try to maintain the essence of it. Thank you. That's what it is. Go um, I just wanted to um, uh, interject a bit then about reconciliation, mm -hmm. because I think there are two aspects that are often confused about it. One is people to people. Mm 
I say you know, have no problem with that because we're all human beings. I think we all want to love each other. I think the type of architecture and work that you are doing uh, illustrates uh, some of that. And yet the world, the way it's structured and the way it's going with, with architecture, engineering, technology, um, is not sustainable and it's not really beautiful. I think it's, it's an abomination if you look at the tallest building in the world in the middle of the desert, I forget which country it is. To me, I'm wondering, you know, what's going on? <laughs> so to me, the whole structure of the world and the way it's going is the enemy of all people. And that um, it has nothing to do with us. this big building. What has it got to do with, with, with a nomad uh, raising sheep? Uh, what has it got to do with family? Um, <clears throat> my point being that, that the structure of the world right now and the, the set of state is part of it. And imperialism is also a part of it. If you can see Canada bombed, I think, four countries at least in recent history, um, that uh, all of the people of the world, I think, want the same thing. But it takes uh, struggle to, to, to get what you want. And struggle is how people reconcile. They struggle together. They develop a unity. They develop a common purpose. And I think that it's going to be very easy for us in Canada to reconcile. But I think the way the structure is, the set is gate, the imperialism, the imperialism, it's impossible to reconcile with this. There can be no reconciliation because their structure, their uh, approach to things, their ultimate goals, has nothing to do with life, and as a matter of fact, you're supposed to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, great architects have great patrons. Frank Lloyd Wright, I can't remember, but he had a lifelong friend who would subsidize his projects and, and, and so forth with many other architects. Um, you touched upon the Toronto example that uh, the federal government saying if this city had one, then every city would want one. Mm -hmm. My point of view would be like, yeah, why not? Of course, exactly. exactly, that is the point. So there's this friction there. Where might the natural patron, the friendly patron come, where it's not a government with an agenda or... <coughs> That's a good question. It's more about advocacy, right? And having to work with, along with allies, I guess you're saying. Um, groups like Architecture for Humanity are very much that platform to allow that conversation to, to, to occur because, uh, like you said, it's a lot of shared values that we do have in making these spaces. Um, that's one example that I would look at. But, and again, I think it's a question onto ourselves to responsibly gift. I think it comes down to that basic element that as an individual, if you have the capacity to share that, I think that just fuels, you know, or it, adds, it empowers a community to actually want to bring other players with gifts to the table. And so that, that's one approach that I think, you know, working with the empowerment of the community already, we can get projects like this off the ground, right, as opposed to, you know, relying on external funding, etc. Uh, another model that I, I keep thinking of is, is why do we have a larger Canadian national uh, resource <coughs> sharing. You know, like, I think why can't First Nations here in the West Coast get their natural resources to infrastructure in cities like Montreal and Ottawa? Because their people are there too, and our people are here, right? So in, in that case, we got to ask that question, and we do have the capacity, and we do have the leaders who have access to those decisions. Whether they're thinking that way is another question. So I think that that's a way that we must look at this. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, at the back of the room, we have some evaluation forms, which I encourage you to fill out. Um, we're constantly taking your feedback into consideration as we adapt our programs and develop them and come up with new programs. Um, so certainly fill out one of those forms, give us your thoughts, and safe travels. Thank you.